Just to show it, or if it's something. relationship to Adam before the fall was beautiful. And she also found that many of her classmates did not think it was beautiful. Um, and she wanted to uh, explore and kind of de defend her intuition that this was a, uh, that there was something deeply good about that relationship. But she didn't want to do it with scripture or theological sources. Um, there's, of course, uh, nothing wrong with doing it that way. But marriage is a natural institution, and grace perfects nature. So it should be possible to defend that intuition 
using purely natural means. So um, over the course of many months, um, Anna has put together uh, what seems to me a, a natural and commonsensical defense of traditional uh, roles in marriage. Um, so please join me in welcoming Anna Klein. Before I begin, I would like to make three notes. The first is that submission of marriage is an ideal. But we live in a world full of broken people, so the reality is not going to be the ideal. I think all married couples should attempt to arrange the structure of their marriage in the way I'm about to explain, but it will not be easy and it will take a lifetime of love and commitment on both parts to perfect. I believe it is in the very name that these roles are in the very natures of men and women, but they still rely on the goodness and virtue of each spouse to really work. This leads into my second note, which is that I am in no way encouraging the submission of a wife in the case of abuse of husband. <clears throat> each spouse must be trying his or her best to really fulfill his or her role in order for this to really work, and in the case of an abusive husband, he is not trying at all. <clears throat> and lastly, submission must be the free, rational choice of the woman. Now to begin. A few days ago, I was thinking how ironic it is that I am the one writing my thesis and giving my oration on how being submissive is natural. If you had told me in high school, or when I first got here, this was the topic of my thesis, I would have laughed at you and then been embarrassed for myself. <clears throat> I was determined from a very young age to make it very clear to everyone around me that I was an independent woman that would never be a man, even if I decided to choose it. And if I did decide to get married, it would not be until I was at least 30, because there were too many things in life I needed to do before I was bogged down with the burden of a husband and children. <laughs> my view of men was unfairly formed by my annoying little brother pretty much since the time he could speak. <laughs> I remember one day in particular that convinced me for a while that I was never going to get married. When we were playing outside and he yelled over to me, hey, chick. Get over here and pull me in this wagon. <laughs> I was shocked. My jaw dropped. And I did what any good older sister would do to a younger brother who needed some discipline. I beat him up. <laughs> Justify her position to you all. But instead, I wrote this thesis because I saw a real problem in the world that I wanted to address. <clears throat> this problem is the idea that men and women are interchangeable, that if a man can do it, so can a woman. To an extent, this is true, but taken to extremes, this is just completely false. Maybe the most shocking conversation I had about this was one day at the lunch table here at WCC when the argument was made that women too should play in the NFL. <laughs> now, maybe I'm just crazy, but that's insane. <laughs> I don't think there's any woman in the world who would not be seriously injured, if not dead, if she was tackled by TJ Watt. <laughs> Men and women are different. <clears throat> And these differences are something they should embrace. <clears throat> the feminist movement has often promoted this idea of a 
quality, which Dr. Laura Schlesinger has problems with. She says that the feminist movement has taken equality and, quote, morphed it into a false concept of sameness. <coughs> this sameness takes the differences between men and women and labels them <coughs> as mistakes. <clears throat> Gone are the traditional concepts of masculine and feminine virtue, and instead we are left in, a, in an ambiguous, genderless, middle ground where neither sex can fully embrace their nature. Women are told to be more masculine and men more feminine, and thus each gender is held back in some way by this idea of sameness. <clears throat> Yet, things can have equality without being the same. Even, even if they have different roles. <clears throat> Every time you sit in the passenger seat of a car, you are submitting yourself to the authority of the driver. No one would argue that you are somehow unequal to the driver, but rather you have a different role than the driver. This equality in importance, despite the superficial difference in roles, is a vital part of humanity that many modern thinkers fail to account for. If men and women do in fact have differences that make them stronger and weaker in different areas and better fit for different roles, should they not embrace these differences? The feminist movement has failed in their self-professed goal of empowering women. Instead of encouraging women to embrace these, their femininity and embrace those things that make them different from men, they have set this idea as their standard. <coughs> all men and all women can do all things the exact same way. They have failed to account for nature. <coughs> In this oration, I would like to use Aristotle as my foundation, Aristotle's definition of nature as my foundation, then look to the biology and psychology of both men and women to see what it is that, the, that their <coughs> natures point them towards, what role it is that their natures point them towards in marriage. <coughs> Aristotle defines nature as, quote, a source or cause of being moved and of being at rest, in that to which it belongs primarily, in virtue of itself, and not in virtue of a concomitant attribute. So in other words, nature is, in some, is an inherent tendency in something to act or react a certain way of its own accord. Aristotle often uses the example of a bed, a wooden bed frame. He says, if the wooden bed frame rots and grows a shoot, it will not grow into another bed frame. Rather, it will grow into a tree, because something inside of it is telling it to grow into a tree. If you also take wood and put it in water, it will float. Something inside of it tells it to react by floating the water. <clears throat> he goes on to talk about nature as both matter and form, of which you can say, you can say nature more precisely of the form. He says, a matter and form of which the latter is the end and all the rest is for the sake of being. Form is what gives the matter its purpose or its role. The matter enables the form to reach that end. If you have a dog that's born blind, it will be somehow impeded in its nature from reaching, from fully reaching its potential of dog. If you compare it to the way that most dogs act, you will see these differences. Because most dogs do have eyes and will act certain ways, but this dog will be impeded in some ways because of its blindness. <clears throat> Yet Aristotle wouldn't take this exception with the, of this dog born without eyeballs as proof that there's somehow there's not somehow a general rule that all dogs are born with eyes. Aristotle is looking at what happens for the most part in determining what natures are. There's a common mentality today that often takes these exceptions and uses them as proof there is no rule. This kind of mentality encourages people to take nature into their own hands and form their own natures. And leads to the mentality that you can change, form your nature to fit your lifestyle instead of your lifestyle to fit your nature. 
Yep. Nature's our purpose. Aristotle says it is plain that nature is a cause, a cause that operates for a purpose. If you have a swan, it always wants to be a duck. It will never thrive because it will be unable to actually be a duck. It will always be trying to embrace the nature of duck, but because it doesn't actually have the nature of duck, it will never actually be good at being a duck. In the same way, because it's not embracing its own nature of swan, it is preventing itself from thriving. In order for things to really thrive, they must embrace their own natures. If women are always trying to be men, they will never thrive. And if men are always trying to be women, they will never thrive. They must embrace the nature that is given to them. <clears throat> men and women are composed of both biology and their psychology. So in order to really understand what it is that their nature, what their nature is, we must look to both. <clears throat> Upon first glance, men and women look very different. This is mostly due to muscle mass. Men, the average man has about 60% more muscle mass than the average woman, and about 90% more overall strength. <clears throat> this points to, or most, even in the most effeminate man, have been, has greater potential to build muscle than the average woman. This enables them to not only fight off predators, but also to prevent other males from stealing their mates. <laughs> Stronger than men, the more likely he is to reproduce. <clears throat> this points to the male role a provider and protector. Looking at females, we see the bodies are made to carry and nurture children, and also to attract males. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the female role of mother is not simply a receptacle for birth. During pregnancy, there is a process called mycochemerism through the placenta the mother and child exchange cells, which stay in the other's body for the rest of their lives, pointing to a lifelong relationship between the mother and child. <clears throat> On biological level, the female role that is pointed to is wife and mother. <clears throat> Doctors Kara Buskmuller and Paul Cruz give this biological definition of both men and women. The male form and function is ordered toward genetic donation to a complementary recipient and to serve a family as a provident defender. The female's form and function is ordered toward genetic reception from a complementary donor and to serve a family in a nourishing role. <clears throat> so the, hu the, man the husband is provider and protector, and the woman, wife, and mother. Even on this basic biological level, we see a sort of hierarchy between the man and woman. The male's role of protector demands that the woman be listened to him. In order for him to actually be able to protect her, she must have trust and respect in his decisions. <clears throat> but men and women are not simply composed of their biology, we must also look to their psychology. <clears throat> Even in the womb, men and women are being formed different. Men tend to be exposed to large amounts of testosterone, and women do not, which lead to different formations in their brain. The male brain forms with stronger connectors in each section of his brain, but weaker universal connectors. And the female brain is composed with weaker connectors in each section of the brain and stronger universal connectors. The only place this is different is in the cerebellum in the male brain where it has stronger universal connectors. Cerebellum is known to control physical motion, which again points to his role, to his greater strength and role, provider and protector. <clears throat> Somebody once described male and female brains to me as male brains are like a waffle and female brains are like a pile of spaghetti. And <laughs> this kind of helps show but how male and female brains have 
at infancy, you can see this difference in the infant girls tend to be more attracted to human faces, whereas infant boys tend to be more attracted to mechanical objects. <clears throat> this anticipates the female tendency to be more people-oriented and the male tendency to be more task-oriented. <clears throat> As they get older, young girls tend to play more with dolls and domestic toys, and boys tend to play more with trucks and mechanical objects. One might make the argument this is simply a cultural phenomenon because parents tend to give their daughters dolls and their sons trucks. But studies have been done on non-human primates that point to the same results. The females tend to be more attract, tend to care more for the young, even at a young age and the males tend to be more task oriented. <clears throat> Dr. Andrew Sodergren, a psychologist, gives this psycholo psychological definition of male and female. Quote, in general, women appear more attentive and sensitive to others, are more inclined to connect with and take care of others, cooperate more readily with others, and the like. Men, on the other hand, are blessed greater physical size and strength, and aptitudes for systematizing, which can help them overcome great physical challenges, make analytical discoveries, and find innovative solutions to problems. So here at the psychological level, we see women, again, tend to be more nurturing and caring, like the roles of wife and mother, and men tend to be more focused on problem solving and tasks, like the role of provider and protector. Dr. Sodergren goes on to talk about <clears throat> a study done by Simon Baron Cohen, which says that, quote, nature has favored the male brain to excel at systematizing, whereas the female brain has been prepared to excel at empathizing. This systematizing versus empathizing points to the male's tendency to be more naturally fit to be a leader. Man's ability to problem solve, see what the problem is, and find a solution enables him to be a better leader. This is not to say that the females cannot be leaders, but rather that it is more in the nature of males to be leaders. Woman's role of empathizing can sometimes make it harder for her to be a leader because she can be blinded by her emotions. <clears throat> Edith Stein, in her essay, Ethos of Women's Professions, says that the female, or the, the, yeah, the female role of submission in marriage is, quote, derived less from the feminine individuality than from the natural vocation of man as guide and protector of his wife. <clears throat> but what does all of this mean about being submissive? If we look at a team, every team needs a captain. I believe it is the male role in marriage to be that captain or head of the house. On a biological level, he has this authority over the woman. And on the psychological level, he seems more fit to be a leader. <clears throat> this is, but man, men and women need each other to balance the other out. Marriage should not just be a one-way street, but a conversation between both the man and the woman. Yes, the man has these tendencies to be a better leader, but the woman's ability to empathize and universalize can actually balance out the man's tendency to become too callous and too focused on just one particular thing. <clears throat> if we look at the word, the etymology of the word submission, you see the Latin word sub and receive. Sub translates to under, and missio to send out. So in reference to marriage, this would mean the wife is sent out under the man's mission. Edith Stein talks a lot about the male and female roles in marriage in her essay, Ethos of Women's Professions. She says that men 
tend to desire to be, tend to be very focused on their projects and their mission. And that they desire people around them to also be interested in their projects and missions. <clears throat> she says that the female role, the female tendency is to be is, is of companion and to be interested in those the missions of the people around her. She points to this complementarity of the male and female role. Men wanting to be very focused on theirs and wanting people around them to be very focused on it, and women women wanting to be focused on people's the missions of the people closest to, to them. <clears throat> There's a the woman takes the man's role, but takes <clears throat> man's mission upon herself, not out of fear, but out of love. There is an important question that every woman must ask herself before she gets married. And that question is, does this man deserve my obedience? Because not all men do deserve obedience. Yet, we can't assume that all men don't deserve <coughs> obedience. <laughs> There's a common idea in our time that if women agree to submission of marriage, they are agreeing quote, to oppression, subjugation, or abdication of any feminine quality of life. What they're confusing is the idea of submission and the idea of blind submission. A submissive wife is not a wife who becomes a slave to his husband and his every whim, and who has no personality and no opinion of her own. A submissive wife is one who has an attitude of respect towards her husband, but is willing to discuss when she disagrees with him and when they can't come to some sort of agreement on big issues, then she must respect, respectfully submit to his authority in the marriage. <clears throat> Dr. Schlesinger goes on to talk about how women who do not place their roles of wife and mother first and foremost are not able to thrive. This is not to say that women cannot have careers but that they're, <clears throat> or a job, but that they make sure they're living first and foremost according to their nature in America. She says women that don't do this Quote, lose the incentive and ability to treat their personal lives with the love, dedication, sacrifice, compassion, and loyalty that will ultimately bring them happiness and a sense of purpose. So women do not place the roles of wife and mother first and foremost, while a very hard time thriving. There is an actual syndrome that results from women trying to do it all, trying to have more than they can actually take on, and not living according to their nature. This is called hurried women syndrome, and the results, the symptoms, are weight gain, low sex drive, moodiness, fatigue, all of which are due to the correct stress caused by trying to do too much. <clears throat> women who do not live putting their role, wives who do not live putting their roles, a wife and mother, first and foremost, People have a very hard time thriving. <clears throat> Some people might argue that submission in marriage implies a sort of inferiority between the man and wife. <clears throat> Yet, if we have a team, the team captain isn't exactly the best player, or more important than the rest of the players. All the players are equally necessary in order for the team to thrive and to win. There's a common analogy given of marriage with the man as the head and the woman as the heart. If you look at the body, the head is on top, rules and directs the body. The heart is in the middle of the body, giving the body life and warmth. Both of these organs are vital for the survival of the body. Without one, the body will die. In the same way, the husband is head of the house and it directs the house. And the wife is the heart of the family, giving it life and form. Both of them are equally important and necessary, and without one, the family will not be able to thrive. <clears throat> the 
before I end, I want to talk about the man's authority in marriage. The man is not just given authority to do with what he wants. He only has authority in the family insofar as he has their common good in mind. Just as a good political leader must make decisions based on the common good of his society, so too the good father must do what is best for the family first and foremost. <clears throat> a good father is selfless instead of selfish. A bad father puts, all, puts his desires before the family's, and he deprives himself, not only, not only deprives himself of a loving home, but more importantly, he deprives his wife and children of the love and care they need and deserve. Men must put their family's needs first and foremost. Husbands must put their family's needs first and foremost. Dr. Schlesinger demands this of men, saying real men are happy to be able to take care of their families no matter what they have to suffer to do it. <coughs> men who do not put their family's needs first and foremost are not real men. The wife's choice to selflessly humble herself and submit to the man's authority in marriage demands that the man also be selfless in giving himself to his family. Thank you. Submission helps the wife to thrive, um, and also how it promotes the common good of the family because there needs to be um, uh, a leader, a team captain, right? Um, but I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how um, the wife's submission might be good for the children or each of the children individually. Um, and also maybe perhaps um, in what way it it um, promotes the true good of the husband rather than just his, his you know, interests. Mm. <clears throat> I think it promotes the good of the children and that it will provide a happy home environment. Um, when it comes, there's going to be disagreements with parents all the time. Um, and if there is a respectful attitude between the husband and wife, then it will be something that the kid, children can watch and maybe imitate themselves someday. Um, but it will be good just for their home life to see the love between their parents and the way that people can disagree without being angry at each other. Um, can you see the second part? Uh, the, the other part was, um, in what way does it benefit the husband? And I don't mean, oh, he gets his way, right? He gets yeah. his selfish interest, but is a true good, right? Um, yeah. Does it help him grow? Um, I think, well, definitely it'll help that, like, um, when he makes decisions, like, sometimes you can be blinded. It's really good to have a second opinion a lot of times. So it'll be good when the wife, like, shares her opinion in a respectful way that's not like this my way or the highway kind of attitude. Um, but so I guess it's good that she's there to balance them out, um, to help him see things he might not see, but also in, in a loving way that makes him, I don't know, I guess, I think, I think it will be more, it will definitely be beneficial to him to have somebody who's, um, not only listening to him, but also advising him. Might it also help him as they grow into a true leader? Yeah, I guess if he has more of the, I think there's more pressure in a way um, for him to make a good decision when he knows that it will be respected. Though she also will correct him. <laughs> Um, so I think I'm 
uh, I understand the, the, the general difference between men and women and uh, when it comes to uh, things like size, muscle mass, uh, ways of thinking, even. Uh, but why would it be better? Can you explain more? Why why would it be better to have a systematizer be your leader rather than an empathetic person? Right? And if I just had a bunch of people and all I knew about them was I have a systematizer and a who's really strong and can carry stuff, and there's somebody who's better at nurturing. Um, can't carry as much stuff, but is more empathetic. Right? It's not clear to me why I should pick one over the other. Yeah. Can you talk about that more? Well, it's definitely important um, to have the empathizer, which is why the wife shouldn't just be like passive. She should definitely be helping the husband lead the family. Both of their goals should be to lead the family together. It's mostly when there is a hard decision that has to be made that they can't come to an agreement on. But I think this like role of submission really comes into play. And I guess that's why I think the systematizing can help because it's probably um, a big decision. But it can't be like cut off from the wife. Like they need to get together. So his systematizing makes him like, I guess, a naturally fit leader and that he can sometimes see <clears throat> past. Like his emotions, he can't be born exactly. He pretend men tend to not get caught up in their emotions. It's not really the case. But I guess I don't want it to be cut off from the wife. Definitely the wife's role of empathy should be joined with his role of systematizing. But I think Yeah, so I see I see the that you need both of them, but I mean, it, the harder thing to argue seems to be who should really be the leader. Right. Who's when it comes down to it? Whose decision is it? Right. And it's uh, as and you pointed out that right, women have the uh, might have the problem that they uh, might be blinded by their emotions. Mm -hmm. But you also said that there's the the possible flaw of a man to uh, to well, it seems to me that men can be blinded by their emotions as well. Mm -hmm. But also just that even if you admit, even if you say kind of on. on general level that's the way it is or something uh, you could also you also point out that there's the possibility of having a, a bad leadership because you somebody lacks empathy right so why so they need to be uh, yeah as you said they need to they need the uh, moderating influence of each other that seems great but the it still seems really hard to me to See the argument why the systematizer over the other one? I think it's. <clears throat> Maybe you can just talk about leadership in general. Yeah, I'm saying it's another way of asking your question like, what model of leadership is behind this argument? It seems to be some kind of image for what a leader is or ought to be that makes the, the man more fit for it, I think. And it's unclear mm -hmm. what. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, that might help. I guess <clears throat> I think <clears throat> that I guess I think that because the man's able to systematize, he has been, he, he can, it's sometimes easier for him to see in this particular situation, like what needs to be done. Whereas women, I'm not saying women can't make that decision, I guess, but maybe it's a little bit easier for men because of their because they can focus on just one particular thing more easily than women. Um, but I guess I wouldn't say that women can't make the decision either. I would just say that a man maybe has, in a man's, maybe, man can, it may be easier for the man to make the decision. 
because of his system. But I don't know if that actually. Yeah, I guess I'm also a little unclear about what systematizing means now. Um, I'm, not because of anything you said, but just as I'm trying to figure out, uh, figure this out. What, what do you mean by that? I mean, because I can think of one thing he says, right, really focusing on a task at hand mm -hmm. and not being distracted by other things, or is that what you mean? Or what, yeah, I guess like. Or is it seeing the big picture? What is it? Seeing the, seeing how something fits in the big picture, what what does that mean? I guess it's like, um, I guess based on personal experience with men, <laughs> sometimes it's easier for them. Like, okay, if I have a problem, if I want to rant about something, I go to my girlfriends because they're going to be like, that is terrible, and I'm like. And they're going to affirm me, and they're going to tell me they're going to feel bad for me, and I'm going to feel great about myself after I talk. <laughs> if I go to my guy friend or my brother, which is very common for my brother, he will be like, "Yes, well, this is what you should do," and I can feel great, but he gives me a good solution to my problem. I'm not saying the girls can't give some good solutions, but maybe because they're for in my experience, male tendency to look immediately for stuff like a solution to the problem without getting caught up in like the you must feel terrible about yourself or this is a terrible situation um, can help when they're making big decisions. But my girlfriends can also give me solutions just they tend to immediately react with emotional support. I guess that's, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I think it helps me. And the other aspect that you focused on, in addition to the systematizing, was the biological uh, men's greater physical strength. And it's pointing to the role of provider and protector, which I, I'm assuming is part of this hierarchy thing. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it's unclear to me why that's a hierarchy. And if it is a hierarchy, how is that not simply you have more authority because you are more powerful, like because you are physically stronger, which is Milton, uh, or, 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 she mentioned that you're, you were you came to this prayer mountain. That's one of the things that Milton is wrestling with with his God. If God gets to be God just because he can, he's more powerful than any other being in the universe. Right? And Milton is actually very troubled by that. Mm -hmm. right. um, it kind of sounds to me like you're saying men get to be in charge because they can, they could beat us up. Right? Because they're strong. They could beat up another man and I guess protect us from other men, but but also they can overpower us, right? So that, that, that to me sounds like, yeah, you get to be the leader because of power and strength. On a biological level, yeah, it is because he has great strength, but we're not just biological. I think it's important that we keep in account that we're rational human beings and that yeah. like, like we have to have a basic respect and appreciation. But you base the role of provider and protector on physical strength. Yes. Along with that, maybe I, maybe I misunderstood something there. This example, <coughs> but men biologically are stronger, so therefore they're, they're providers and protectors, therefore, right, they have this hierarchical position. I think because they're stronger, it may, and like if we go just purely biological level, then they're going to be the protector of the woman because, I mean, it makes sense to protect the woman because they're strong, yes. <clears throat> so I guess in that, at a biological level, it's their strength that gives them this sort of hierarchy over the woman. Um, but it is in the role of protecting. So like, yeah, but we aren't just biological creatures. So I think it's very important to take into account, take into account the their rationality and just their basic level of like we're both human beings and we need this equal treatment and um a man has to have like definitely have respect for a woman in a marriage otherwise he's not going to be a good husband um, why yeah why is the role of protector provider a higher <coughs> one 
I think I'm really wrestling with that. So if you make distinctions between nurture and protector, why, maybe this is just not the right asking Dr. Spada's question, right? But yeah, why is protector, why does protector get to be yeah, there's something kind of weird, right? right? The bodyguard isn't yeah. the, the, bodyguard, isn't yeah, the boss, right? Yeah. So right. how does a the, protector... Yeah. What, what, what's different? The guardians of the city, right? Don't rule the city. Yeah. Yeah. The public. I guess there's a sort of respect and trust that is demanded of the protector, between the protector and the protected. Like, if the protector <laughs> don't actually ever trust the person who's protecting them, they probably won't listen to him, and he won't actually be able to do his job. So I guess that's like... It places him in a different role than them, which I think, in a way, because he's protecting them and they have to listen to his directions, does give him like an authority to an authority over them, I guess, in a way. But they have to listen to him in that respect. Um, you talk about nature, you talk about deficiencies in nature, something they need to do, deny nature. Uh, but then in your in your own language, um, I notice things like tendency, um, being in general kind of thing. I actually am curious about the not in general. Um, so that's very vague. Um, a woman who does not, is not nurturing, the argument I suppose could be that she is deficient in nature or not embracing her nature, or that she simply doesn't fit the sort of general tendency. Um, I, I, I'm wondering which one you're actually arguing. That there, so that, that uh, there's an inviolable, inviolable nature, human and women, all men, all women fall into right, those categories. Mm -hmm. To deviate from those categories in any way is a deficiency. Or is there any kind of right spectrum? There's a spectrum. Because okay. Yeah. Uh, we aren't all exactly the same, so like our bodies are built differently. Um, some women have high levels of testosterone, some men have lower levels of testosterone. Like we all are on a spectrum, but um, so why aren't the roles in the spectrum? I think in marriage it's good to like I guess yeah for the sake of children. I think it's good for like even a stronger <coughs> woman or a woman who is a little less nurturing to try. Like she's not going I'm not saying she needs to just like jump into this box of perfectly nurturing women, but to try to more to embrace that role more of nurturing and mother. And for a man who's maybe like a little bit less um, a little bit less of a leader naturally to try to become more of a leader than a man. Just for the sake. Do you have a short good example? Um, my, my, my last question is um, do you see these distinctions and roles in the Genesis account? I'm thinking of JP2 reading of Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, okay. yeah. Well, so I am just curious. Uh, yeah, do you see the distinctions and roles in, in the Genesis account? Yeah, I think so. I. I saw it in Milton, which isn't exactly yeah. <laughs> the biblical account, but um, it's easy. yeah. Um, but <laughs> um, I guess I'm trying to remember what the Bible says. A man, I mean, in God's image, man, female and female, he created them. He gives both both of them the injunction right to subdue the earth and apply. Yeah, um, I guess it's like interesting to me that the male was created first in the Genesis account. Um, I guess that doesn't exactly mean that, but like man is given the task to name all the animals. And I think, ah, now I am really confusing about the Genesis. I think that he says that like. Um, I think he says for okay, this is definitely something never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess God talks to Adam, he calls Adam first, 
this is I'll have to say this, yeah. Anyway, I think there's a sort of like Adam then talks to Eve, tells Eve what God said. Those kind of things. Okay. Oh, that, that <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna bounce off um what Dr. Shipper said a little bit and then put it in a different perspective for you. Try and get maybe um so what happens if you take a strong woman and she wants to be holy and she wants to be these things and so she is submissive 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 to the point mm -hmm. and you're i think when you're talking about this you're talking in an ideal world mm -hmm. what if that husband isn't that ideal husband and at what point does it become well, not healthy mm -hmm. to her for her to keep being submissive and how do we teach our children that difference <coughs> and so again where is that hierarchy um you know, if you're just constantly being submissive as a wife, mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking it, I think, maybe you're looking at it as everybody's going to marry it perfect. Well, that would be ideal. And that doesn't happen. So I think that it's really important that the wife, um, well, both, but like in Peter, <coughs> keep in mind the good of the family. It cannot be like, she can't take her being submissive to, to the point that they're making decisions that are detrimental to their family, like to their children or even yeah. so how do you decide that? Um, well, I mean, I don't think everything's black and white. Yeah. I guess it depends also on her husband, how open he is to the person, <coughs> and like, is he just, I guess there has to be a lot of discussion between them. If he's not open to that, then I think it would be probably detrimental to be just like like blindly or just submissive. Like you'd have to maybe take things more into account. I think did I answer it? Not really, but no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James. Thank you, Anna. I know you were primarily focused on marriage in your thesis narration. I wonder if you could apply some of what you are talking about and thinking about, about the relative rules of man and woman, to maybe a context like here at the school. I know you mentioned the leadership earlier on. How would you suggest the outdoor leadership program, for example? Um, I am, I think that women should be submissive in marriage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because um, it's in the nature of women also to be pregnant. But I'm not going to say that women should be pregnant whenever they can. But only in the circumstances that she has the means to provide for and the husband. And I think that a man has to deserve the submission of the wife or the woman. Um, and I don't think that just any man is going to deserve that. So I think it has to be a very like long-term committed relationship in order for a woman to actually be like. That's why I think she should be a So I thought we wanted to systematize it as leaders because they are better leaders. So the answer to change this question, wouldn't it be better to have our men be the leaders because they're better at the systematizing thing? And that's what a leader needs to be pretty good at. There yeah. perhaps maybe more needed to be said about the <coughs> pregnancy, right? As a biological fact, not just the greater strength of the man, but the fact that the woman gets pregnant just aids nurses, nurtures, does that have something to do with why the woman should be submissive only to a husband? Yeah, I think. I think in a way um, that the woman should be, I think the man should also be very deserving of the woman. Like he has to earn this in a way like through dating and then engagement and then marriage. And I think he's deserving of woman's submission. Um, I don't think, or I guess I don't, I'm confused. I don't think. Um, the, I don't think the women are unable to be leaders, but in America, I think one of them has to be the leader. And I think that the man, has a natural tendency to be a better leader. Um, 
but that doesn't mean that outside of marriage or even in marriage, like the woman is going to be a leader in something. But she's going, she's not waiting or asking her husband to let him question. She's going to have to make everyday decisions all the time. I think it's mostly in the big things. And there's big questions, but this whole commission really comes into play. So that doesn't mean that like a woman outside of marriage or like a woman at the school couldn't be a leader. I just think it's more natural for the man to be a leader. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think the question that was coming to mind is with the idea of your expressing of sort of feminine virtue in marriage being like part of that being submission. What would like sort of what does a, is a man supposed to take away from that? Like, how does a, cult a husband cultivate charity with that knowledge of that's what virtue in his wife would look like? It seems like it's very easy for a man to turn that into arrogance in himself. Wait, I think I missed the question. Part. Right. So I think I think it's very it, it's it can be very easy for a man to take to hear the idea that a wife ought to be submissive and turn that into it and take that as reason to be arrogant. Mm -hmm. So how would, what should a husband <coughs> do with that knowledge if that's the idea of what virtue in a wife is? Um, I think he should be very respectful, I guess, and very careful with his own, like making sure he is not taking it too far. Um, and I think a helpful way for him to prevent that from happening is to be focused on his family and doing what's best for his family before, like, placing his family before himself. So I guess maybe just the second part of that is, would you say then submission is something that a husband should expect from his wife then? Or? Um, I think that it will help the marriage thrive for the woman to be submissive, but I don't think that the husband can demand it of the wife, or it won't actually be submission because she has to make that choice herself. Otherwise, it's not going to be healthy, or like they're not, it's not going to be a very loving and respectful relationship because there's going to be a lot of tension between them if he's constantly saying, you need to be submissive to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I found this a super convincing um, talk, especially I was very similar to you in high school, so I thought you did a great job. Um, I was just curious, you talked about how thriving comes from the fulfillment of your nature, mm -hmm. and I know some people uh, believe in different temperament types, some people may not, um, but what would you say to your temperament being an innate part of your nature, and if thriving comes from the fulfillment of your nature, there will be some men who are um, mm -hmm. in their temperament more naturally followers, or some women who are naturally more leaders. And then is being a leaderly woman but being submissive uh, a lack of fulfillment of your nature, or vice versa, for the man being a follower? No, I don't think so, because we talk a lot about um, active follower followership here at the school. And I think for a woman who is naturally more of a leader, she can actually, well, first of all, she's not just like, she does make a lot of little everyday decisions that she is a leader, like she is helping her husband with family. Um, so, and I think a way she can also help herself thrive is she is like in the big decisions, like maybe going to have to defer to the authority of her husband when they can't come to some sort of agreement. But, that doesn't mean that she's not like helping him by sharing her opinion and discussing it with him. So I think there'll be times, but there are always times in marriage where we're going to have to like sacrifice or like work on ourselves a little bit in order to really like for the marriage to work. So I think there'll be times where she's going to have to probably like maybe hold back more than she would like and let the man lead. And the same way with a man who has um, less, I don't remember what you said, but like a quieter man or something. I don't remember what you're saying. Um, I think there will be times where he's going to have to step up and lead the family opposite to when she's going to have to hold back. But I don't think it will be against him. Um, thank you so much, Anna. This is a very good.
Good talk. Um, uh, just bouncing off a few of the questions that have gone around, um, it makes sense for when it comes to decisions surrounding protecting the family that the man has the final say. But what about decisions that um, are based in more empathetic decisions that the, that the wife would be better at um, coming up with answers with? Uh, for example, uh, the daughter goes through a really bad breakup. She wants to go run away and shave her head and do all these crazy things. Um, and there's no way to like ration with her in this sit state. And so um, kind of the decision of the family would come down to a more emotional, I guess, decision. Um, so then my question is, is there a sense in which the husband has to be or needs some sort of submission to the uh, wife in that sense? Because she has, she is better at the more empathetic role. Yeah, I think that the, in a good marriage, then the husband will see the wife, like, I guess, yeah, the husband's like, this is more your area. You can take care of it. Like, that's fine. But, like, I guess it still relies on both of them being, like, trying to do what's best for the family. Mm -hmm. So I think that she could be a leader still, but, like, that's the blessing of the man. But he, yeah, it's kind of hard to do. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I, I mean, so it kind of sounds like maybe this is unfair. If you can tell me if that is unfair, but it, it sort of sounds like you're saying not all stereotypes apply to everyone, but at least within marriage, everyone should try to be more stereotypical. <laughs> not you know, not all extreme. men are nurturing, not all men are, you know, our male <clears throat> leaders, but within marriage, at least, everyone should try to be as stereotypical as they can, as they can possibly be, because that makes our healthy I wouldn't say as stereotypical as they could possibly be, but I think, I think when it comes to, like, communication, that's a really difficult thing to command on. And I think a way to help smooth the ride of marriage is for both of them to try to like, or is, I guess when they go into marriage to have like these pet kind of thing um, might make this communication a little bit easier. But I don't. It's not going to look the exact same in every marriage. Like before they get married, they should have a discussion about like their values, what's important to them, and. I think that that should be what's kind of what they look back to. So I'm not saying that they should just like, um, I don't know. I, guess not. I think that every marriage is going to look very different. So I wouldn't say that there is this box that every man, every husband should fit in and every woman should fit in. But in certain areas, like when big decisions need to be made, maybe they have to assume the stereotypes a little bit more. Yeah, but it's still going to look different than I think it is. Can, can you help me understand better why marriage is the magic sort of switch for this thing? Mm -hmm. Um, I not like because if you're basing this right in, in nature, so this is natural, natural role for men and women. Yeah, I don't, I'm not understanding why it only applies to marriage. I guess I chose marriage because <coughs> marriage is a place for like these differences in men and women to me are most apparent in a lot of ways. Like it's where you have one man and one woman and you see a lot of their differences and their differences being complementary. But I guess it also because marriage is the only place where you have I guess nowadays it's not so much, but like a lifetime commitment between men and women. I think that the woman's choice of submission is something that just needs to be deserved. And I think that the commitment of a lifetime is something that makes a man more deserving of this. Because like I think it could be really unhealthy for all women to just practice submission universally to all men. Because not all men are good. Like you have to know this is a good man or and to really deserve the submission. But is that because men are bad or because 
but the in the ideal world actually we, we would submit to all men, but it's just unfortunately they're all bad, or many of them are bad. <laughs> and you're not going to submit to all of them, but when you get married, you're going to make sure that you found a really good man that you then can submit to. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's because this is also a place where, like, I know in like the workplace, there's oftentimes. A man and a woman working together, but a marriage there's constantly a man and woman working together. So it's kind of like there needs to be some sort of role, or like the submission becomes more important, I guess. But I don't think even a woman in the workplace, because like the guy there doesn't have, he hasn't committed to her in any way. Like he hasn't ever exactly <coughs> deserved this submission that I think the husband has worked for. Could it also again have something to do with the having of children, right? Yeah. So that we need a leader when there's a common good that that a community needs to be directed towards, and the family is a community of a, of a mother and father and children, and that maybe the leader role becomes more important um, as opposed to just the you know we're we're friends or colleagues role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. It's true that there's more of a common good. So, yeah. A more, a more, um, a more important common good, I guess. Like, formation of children is very important and very, I don't know, uh, vital, I guess. So, it's, more important that there's a strong leading team for the formation of children. I have a lot more questions, but I think we're out of time. <laughs> so thank you.